American comedy was shaped by Jews, I think. Part of that was the immigrant experience. It's always the outsider looking in. But part of it, I also think, is part of what Judaism does, which is you read the Torah, you read the Talmud, and you analyze it. You're not just listening to the priest and whatever they tell you and say five Hail Marys and everything's good. You, you're supposed to really take it apart and understand it. And that's what comics do. We take everything apart and look at it through our humor prism. If life is a mystery, who done it? Welcome to Ye Gods. I'm Scott Carter. Today you'll hear my chat from a year ago with actress and comic Susie Essman from HBO's Curb Your Enthusiasm. The day before we talked, Susie gave a eulogy for comic genius Gilbert Gottfried. In his honor, we're releasing this episode today, April 12th, the first anniversary of his passing. In the Jewish tradition, the first anniversary of a death is called a Yarsite. With sacred readings, candle lighting, charitable giving, and fasting, the tragedy of loss and the lasting legacy of loved ones are honored. Something Gilbert could have made hilarious. Later, I'll reply to listener Kathleen Valley Stein's email on the Rubicon moment her family faced about hospice care. So you see a theme here? I know it sounds heavy, but I think you'll enjoy it. It is now my pleasure to welcome one of the people in this world whom I love the most, and that is my friend Susie Esmond. Susie, it is a delight to see you and talk to you. And I love you too, Scott. There's love in the air. <laughs> Not only love in the air, but there is love traveling back and forth 3,000 miles between my uh, place in California and yours in New York. And we hope that that wavelength, that current going back and forth cross country is going to be a blessing to all those who may hear this. What I want to talk to you about first is something that I remember tell you telling me about decades ago when we first met. We met in 1984, correct? 1984 at the comic strip on the Upper East Side of New York. And it was my first time as an MC on a Saturday night, and you were the first act that I brought to the stage. <laughs> oh boy, we had a lot of milestones in those days. You know, we had a there was a, a lot of firsts. A lot of firsts. I remember, like first successful out of Manhattan gig. Yeah, those were hard. A lot of those gigs, those were really, really hard. I, I remember just dying in some of those Jersey gigs, and and I remember. The rainy night house, bombing terribly, just kind of getting through and and my thinking, well, it's them. And then the headliner was Rich Jenny, who did yeah. 45 minutes completely clean, completely smart. And, and I remember leaving that night going, well, it's not them, it's me. I have to work harder. I have to be better. There are different theories about that. Some comedians say it is never the audience. Pat Cooper always used to say it is never the audience. Sometimes it is. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it is the audience. Yeah. It is now so fun to look back on those days, but during those days, we didn't know that they that wouldn't be our fate for the rest of our lives. Well, but there was there was something incredibly exciting about those days. I mean, it, it was, you know... Yeah. It, we we were young and we had energy and and we were you know we were out there just selling our wares and doing it and and it, there was something so creative and and constantly you know we'd go out after every show to the diner and talk about this worked and that didn't work and we go over our material and it always felt like at least our group that we all just really wanted to be really good comedians it wasn't about getting the the, the TV series and it wasn't about you know, that kind of success. Success was getting a good spot on a Saturday night. That was how we, we judged our success. Because my original orientation was to theater and also I'd been a journalist, I did have a sense that this was always just going to be a phase in my life that eventually I was going to go to theater as a playwright or a director, or it was going to go to movies or television or something. 
had you, before you started doing stand up, what was your, had you done any performing before this? What got no. you to do stand up for the first time? Uh, I was in a very, very bad place. I wanted to be a, a character actress. I wanted to be like a Carol Burnett sketch actress. And if you recall, I used to do all these characters, which I haven't done in years, but that's, I, I never spoke in my own voice for the first six months of doing stand up. I used to just do these characters. But stand up was not on my radar, and friends kind of talked me into it. But I was in a very, very bad place in my life. I was in a deep, deep depression. Let's go into that a little bit because one of the things that fascinates me, of the many things that fascinate me about you, it's that you started stand up, which most people, whenever you tell them you're trying to be a stand up, they regard it as the most dangerous possible thing that one could possibly do. At the same time, you were coming out of, or you were dealing with this depression by which you went into, you're the only person I know who did classical Freudian analysis. Yeah. On the couch four times a week. I, I was in a very, very bad, I mean, I was suicidal. I was in a very dark place, which I think if I hadn't been in that dark of a place, I would never have done stand up because at this point I had nothing to lose. It's so scary. It was just, if I, if there was something else that I liked to do or I could do, I would have done it. I would not have gone into that profession, but I was in, I just, you know, it, it was, things were so bad. And I started therapy, which I eventually turned into the psychoanalysis with the same therapist. She called me yesterday, actually. Really? Yeah. At the, at, at, and they were, you know, the, the analysis started maybe a month before the standoff. I mean, they were right around the same time. And I don't know that I could have done one without the other. I mean, I could have done the analysis without the standup, but I couldn't have done the standup without the analysis. And it's funny because other comics will say the opposite. I, I know people that we know well who would say things like, well, I don't want to go into therapy and, and lose that thing that I have, that edge that I have, whatever it is. They're completely wrong. And those people that I know have not had successful lives either. Yeah. And I find that yeah. that's a persistently adolescent approach to existence that let me protect whatever these wounds are because I think the wounds are better for me than not to have them. And actually, if they were to rid themselves, not everybody has these wounds, but it, but those that have them, if they don't get rid of them, the wounds reassert themselves. In some other way. And, and I do yeah. think it's a cliche, but I do think most comedians do have those deep wounds. I, I think they do. Why else? I mean, what would propel one to, I mean, I, as I get older, I increasingly, when I am talking to, let's say, my daughters or their friends or young people who I know, and they have the opportunity to not go into show business, my attitude is, hooray. Yeah. If there's something else you love. Do you then come into therapy and talk about struggles you're having in the stand-up? Does the, does the therapy help provide material? For the stand-up, what was the interaction between the two? I think that I, I would say 85% of my many years on the couch was talking about my mother. <laughs> I think at least 85%. But the thing about the, the therapy, I mean, I wouldn't talk about material or, or anything like that. But it, the, the purpose of psychoanalysis is to strip away the unconscious, to make the unconscious conscious. And I, there were so many things holding me back in ev every aspect of my life, n not just my performing. That was the purpose to me, was to know, know thyself. Like Socrates said, like Freud said, know thyself. And I always felt like the better I knew myself, the better I was going to be on stage. And it was true. And I, I was growing at the same time. I was growing as a comedian. I was growing as a woman. I, there used to be this Oh God, I don't even know how to describe this. But I remember in my early 20s, I started when I was 28. Uh, when I in my early 20s, I would just be screaming inside that there was this woman inside of me that I had no idea who she was, but she was screaming to come out. And I couldn't figure out how to creatively express myself in that way that I knew was there and it was driving me crazy. Once I started to find the 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 way to express myself, which was through performing on stage, the despair just kind of 
left. You know, the depression just lifted because I had an outlet. It was almost as though I was reborn, that I tried to kill myself and then I was resurrected as a comedian. This is a show about religion, isn't it? Well, it's a, it's about it's about how people get through life. It's yeah, about and how that was it for me, Scott. I was resurrected as a comedian, and that was the thing. It saved my life. It literally saved my life. I had had some experiences where I tried to enter therapy and had a terrible therapist. Well, that's that's it's really about finding the right therapist. I had several bad therapists in my early 20s that could do tremendous harm 20s that could do tremendous harm tremendous harm combined with i came from a culture where we believed in fact one of my siblings said to me once uh when i said that i was in therapy he said oh you're you're buying a friend there was a sense that if you went into therapy it was a sign of weakness and you were indulging yourself and why talk about the past the past is past but what I came to learn over time is the William Faulkner quote, the past isn't dead. It isn't even past. No. That if you no. don't deal with it in the way that you were talking about, if you don't deal with it, the past is your present and, and it's your destiny. That's right. And I, I think something that people as adults don't understand is how powerful that internalized mother and father voice are in them. It's your first connection. It's your earliest connection. And it's so deeply ingrained. And even if they're dead, it doesn't matter. And you mentioned that uh, a lot of your therapy, and, and you need not go into it specifically, but you mentioned that a lot of it was dealing with your mother. I was always fascinated by your household growing up that your parents were American communists. Well, my mother. My mother. Your mother was. My oh, my I didn't even know was, that. Yeah, my father, well, he was a lefty, he, you know, he, he, he had the nation and all that stuff, that, you know, delivered every week. Um, th there were certain things that my parents did correctly, that they did very well. And one was exposing me to uh, literature. My mother was a Russian professor. And, you know, there was every Chekhov short story and every goggle and every, whatever that they, they were all there for me to pull off the bookshelf and read. There was books everywhere. They took me to the theater. They took me to Broadway. There was always music playing in the house. So that it, I knew that that was a thing to, to listen to. I knew that that reading was a thing that one did. I knew that theater was something, a positive thing in somebody's life and it, it, that art changed people and that it was a possibility to do that for a living. That they absolutely did right. My mother uh, was uh, from a, big lefty lefty family they were she was in the young communist league and all that kind of stuff you know in the 30s 40s whenever my father was blacklisted because of that because of my mother and, and my uncle was blacklisted my my mother's whole side of the family experienced that during mccarthyism but they they were they used to bring me to vietnam marches anti vietnam war marches and to civil rights uh, marches and all that kind of stuff. They used to bring me. I remember going to those things and they instilled in me a tremendous sense of right and wrong, uh, of what injustice is in the world. And just to be clear, so your mom was a teacher and your dad, what was his profession and from what was he blacklisted? My mother was a Russian teacher. She taught the Russian language. There was a tremendous reluctance to admit what the Soviet Union had become. You know, I mean, it took them a long time to be anti-Stalin. You, you know, they, 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 they bought it hook, line, and sinker. They were like, you know, party line. My father was a doctor, but my father was a, a, a different, my father was an interesting guy. He was a high school dropout. He uh, never went to college. He never graduated from high school. He was drafted in the army. Uh, during World War II, and they gave him an IQ test, and his IQ was like through the roof, and they sent him to medical school. There was a program that they were sending certain people to different uh, engineering and medicine, and you know, I think that there, there was a fear that all these young men were going off to war and they were going to die. So they, there was this program, and somehow he got in it, and he went to medical school, but he was a high school dropout. 
And so when you say he was blacklisted, then was he able to be a doctor later? Well, later or? on, what, he was working at the Veterans Hospital because there was a certain amount of payback for the Army sending him to medical school. And he was at the Veterans Hospital and he got a dishonorable discharge and they, they blacklisted him from working there. I don't know the full details. One of my regrets in life is that I didn't ask my parents and my grandparents enough questions. Everybody feels that way. <laughs> yes, that's true. And you've heard it as part of your upbringing, as part of your collective narrative of the, the family. Yeah. And you don't want to go beyond it to find something else. The, the thing with, with my parents, my mother had no religion whatsoever. My father was brought up not religious, but my father was definitely Jewish. I do think he was bar mitzvah. None of us were, but we were not brought up with any formal religion at all. Was there ever a time in your adolescence when you asked them about that or whether or not be, if you if you had friends who were getting confirmed or getting bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah that you, that you wanted to have that kind of initiation ceremony into adulthood? No. As a matter of fact, I, that's another thing I always felt that they did correctly was not indoctrinate us with religion. Because when you're a child, you know, it's, it's just happenstance which religion you're born into. And then that becomes your belief system because I was born into that. It makes no sense to me. Religion never made any sense to me in that way. I believe that religion serves a tremendous purpose for people, especially in the sense of community more than anything else. Um, and, and the rituals are important. You know, having been at a funeral yesterday and here in Kaddish, and uh, which is the, the, the Jewish prayer for the day. It, it, all of that is important, but there's so much of it that is not. For me, what the way I was brought up is that that code is within, is that we have a moral compass. I had this fight with my brother-in-law. My, my husband was uh, raised Catholic and my brother-in-law was sending his kids to religious instruction. And he said he doesn't believe it, but he's sending them because he wants them you know, to know right from wrong and to know that if it's wrong, they're going to go to hell. And I said, wouldn't you prefer they know if it's wrong just because it's intrinsically wrong than that they think it's wrong because they're going to be punished? Isn't that creating a better person to know right from wrong because it's in deep inside of you and you have a, a moral sense of what you should and should not be as opposed to being afraid to do something because you're going to go to hell? That makes no sense to me. What's uh, one of the things that's most amazing to me about you is this up, this very unusual upbringing by which your parents may not have been affiliated with a religion, and yet they instilled in you a strong sense of morality and of justice. Justice, absolutely a sense of justice. You know, um, Curb Your Enthusiasm, show that I've been on for 11 seasons. If you analyze Curb, it's all about injustice. That's all Larry's really interested in. Not all, but I mean, it's always about, he is so focused. He's, he's a rabbi. He is so focused on the just and the unjust and the tiny little petty injustices that are done to people in their lives. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's such a successful show, because he makes that funny. Well, we did a, we did a project called Curb the Discussion when Larry sold the rights to the first, I think, eight, eight or nine seasons at the time uh, to a basic cable channel, and he needed time by which all of the episodes could be done in an hour. So we did different discussions, had rabbis and psychiatrists as well as comedians and, and actors. But what was interesting to me was you and I then had to go back over every single episode. And mm -hmm. I told Larry later that I said, this is all divided into two groups. Either you're offending someone else's notion of appropriateness, or they are offending yours. That's right. what everything in this show is about. Um, That's true. And, 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 and you're right. There is a, whether or not you agree with Larry's morality or the morality that others are trying to impose upon him, there is something reassuring about watching a show or a movie or reading a book where morality is being examined. There's no way you can come away from watching an episode of, of Curb and not that many other shows where you have to take it into your life and decide if what you've seen is appropriate or not. And, and laugh and be able to laugh. Yes, yes.
Yeah. See, yeah. Scott, that was, a, I pray to the humor God. That was always my religion was humor. You know, Judaism in a sense, uh, you know, you talk about not as now, but you know, it, it, all, all of our humor ancestors in this country was very, very Jewish. Your Jack Benny's and your George Burns and you know, all, all the people, the Marx whose shoulders brothers, we, the Marx brothers, all the people whose shoulders we, uh, we stand on. The fact that humor in this country is so shaped by Judaism is interesting. You know, I, I was telling you uh, off the air that our dear friend Gilbert Gottfried died this week and I was at his funeral yesterday and I, I gave a eulogy. And the last thing that I said was he made a lot of people happy and that was a successful life. He made millions of people laugh and that was a successful life. And it was. Gilbert had a complete devotion to the one wavelength of humor, that his personality was at every moment, it was like a radio dial where he's trying to find a channel and he mm -hmm. was going through the radio dial, dial trying to find the note of humor. And once he got on that station, he was going to stay there. Yeah. And stay there repeatedly. You know, I mean, Gilbert with his repetition compulsion was just <laughs> crazy. But he, he, in any given situation, he knew where the funny was. He knew he where it was. He would hit that funny word or funny idea repeatedly, almost like an old time blues guitarist mm -hmm. would hit the right note, that, that right sweet, sour note and hit it over and over. And, and he knew exactly where it was and it gave him tremendous joy. Tremendous joy. I have laughed harder with him than I have ever laughed with anyone in my life. Seriously. Uh, I, I one time had the absolute joy of going on this out of town gig. I was middling, he was headlining. And I think maybe in the town there was going to be an MC and someone was driving us and we drove from Manhattan to Binghamton, New York. It was a marathon. And I think by time we got to Binghamton, my sides were aching because he and I had been laughing the entire time. Yeah. He loved and to laugh. Loved to laugh and loved to be, if you're in a car, all other life notions are suspended. You are in a car. You're a passenger. You can completely go into your head and let your head take you to the joyous place where it wants to live. And he also, like you, had so much esoteric knowledge, you know, of old movies. And he was, he was very, he was quite brilliant. But, uh, you know, I could see you connecting to him very well. The thing about, about Gilbert, and, and this is how I feel uh, about my life as well, is thank God he had that, he found that thing. Because, you know, you get to be a certain age and you look back on your life and you think, you know, what, what is my life and what is my purpose? I, he was born to make people laugh and he did that. He made people laugh and he made people happy. You know, it, 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 to, to be able to make people laugh, millions of people laugh and to make them to change their life in some way. People have endorphins and it's healing and it's a positive thing. You're putting out, a, we're also, you know, negative comedians and, and you know, we're, we're not Pollyanna-ish and all that kind of crap. We're putting out something beautiful into the world. Well, let me say that you, you have been exceedingly generous with your time, and it's always a delight to talk to you, and I feel like I could go on and on forever. One of the things for those of us who've gotten to have long lives is the generosity of time that is that only it just keeps deepening our relationship. And so grateful to have known you and so grateful to get to keep to know you. And I hope that lasts a long time, and I thank you very much. Scott, we'll be friends forever. And now for the semi-sermonette in my homily opinion. Each week I share my thoughts and ask your response. Well, today I'll reply to one of the emails I've been delighted to receive. In this first season's third episode, which featured my conversation with actress and Pulitzer Prize-nominated playwright Anna DeVere Smith, I asked listeners to tell me a Rubicon moment when they committed to an idea 
outside their comfort zone. Journalist Kathleen Valley Stein emailed me about how, in the year 2000, she persuaded her terminally ill father to choose hospice care for his final days, that he might not die in a hospital in pain attended by strangers, but at home, with dignity, cared for by loved ones. Later, Stein decided to turn this experience into a book, Loving Choices, Peaceful Passing, Why My Family Chose Hospice. Published in 2019, it won the New York Independent Book Award on an important subject that many understandably avoid. Well, I bought her book, and I finished it last night. It's an often touching no-frills prose account of an unperfect family's reluctant but courageous acceptance of a call to action in the final chapter of a man's life. Stein's family was Midwest stoic. They did not express love. They did not seek help. Now, in a crisis beyond her experience, Stein asked the hospital's Dr. Archer to help convey to her father that he please consider not if, but how he would die. Later in the father's room, the doctor quietly but firmly said that the father's condition was terminal and more chemo would only make him feel worse. I don't want to feel any worse, the father finally said. I can't get sicker, writes Stein. Dr. Archer was a highly trained physician, but it wasn't his medical knowledge that came through. It was his humanity. Mom and I needed to be there to support Dad, but we never could have had this conversation without the doctor. After that, asking for help got easier for Stein and the whole family. Not everything went right for them, but much of it did. You know, we often kick down the road life's painful topics until they knock at our door. Loving Choices is no beach read, but it might be worth having as a reference for when that knock comes on the door that you do not want to answer, but you must. Email me your thoughts at yegodspodcast at gmail.com and please follow us on all social media platforms at Ye Gods Podcast. Or you can review us on Apple Podcasts. So until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>